scripts for our uh, lectures uh, this week, and so uh, you'll be able to take something back with you and read it and uh, continue to educate yourself on the things that we are discussing uh, this week. Uh, for me, our speaker this morning is an extremely uh, special speaker. Uh, he's had a tremendous amount of influence on me uh, for the last 35 years, both positive and negative. Um, but there's two things that uh, I'm extremely grateful for our speaker for. Uh, number one, his wife is responsible for introducing me to my wife. Uh, they were roommates in college, and as a result of that, actually all four of us got engaged on the same night in New York City uh, 20 years ago. It's hard to believe, but 20 years ago uh, this very year. Uh, and so I'm indebted to him uh, and her for that. Uh, the second reason I'm indebted to him is because I actually would not be here if it was not for him. Uh, I don't even know if, he, if he's aware of this, but back in, uh, I guess it was around the year 2000, um, I was going through a pretty hard time. Uh, I was kind of the prodigal child. I had kind of moved off and I was working. And one weekend, he invited me to spend the weekend with him, and so I went and we hung out all weekend. And that Sunday morning, I went with him to church. He was 16 years old. He was preaching for a small church, the Highland Church, and uh, right outside of Waynesboro, I guess, Tennessee. And he preached a Guy in Woods sermon. Some of you uh, may remember Guy in Woods. Uh, but it was the rewards and the punishments of God are threefold. And, uh, and it stuck with me and it hit me. And we were supposed to hang out that afternoon. And after sermon, I, I looked at him and said, I got to go home. And, uh, and that was kind of the journey that got me into preaching school that became a spiritual boot camp for me that kind of put me on the trajectory of the course I am on now. And so uh, I'm indebted to him in more than one way. Uh, Alden Bass is our speaker, Dr. Bass. He comes to us today from Oklahoma Christian uh, University. Um, let's see here. He, uh, he learned the craft of preaching from his father, David, and his grandfather, Mr. Herschel. Uh, he received a BA in religious studies from Yale University, an MTS from Vanderbilt, and a PhD in church history from St. Louis University in 2014. Uh, he's taught for Lipscomb, St. Louis Christian College, and for the past six years, he's been a professor of Bible at Oklahoma Christian uh, University. In addition to university work, Alden has held several uh, ministry positions. He's been an intern for Apologetic Express. Uh, for four years, he and his wife served as missionaries in Honduras. They also did inner city work in St. Louis with the North City Church of Christ for a decade, and he's currently a member of the Memorial Road Church of Christ in Edmond, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Candace, have been married for 17 years, and they have five children. And so this morning... Uh, Alden comes to speak on to us on divine dialogue, an introduction to the book of Job. Uh, before he comes to speak, uh, let's pray. Dear most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, Father, we are so indeed grateful for your grace and your mercy and your loving kindness that you pour upon us every day. We're thankful, Father, that you have chosen to bring us to this place at this very hour so that we can study your word. And Father, we just pray that uh, you be with Alden as he speaks. Uh, we pray that you fill him with your spirit. We pray that you fill him with truth. And uh, we pray that he will give us the message that you would have him to speak to us at this time. We ask this prayer to be in your will, not our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you learned two important things about me from Jeremy. One, that a lot of my greatest accomplishments are actually my wife's great accomplishments. And the other is that my best lessons come from somebody else, too. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here. It's really nice to be with Jeremy. I'm really glad that he's here. You guys are blessed to have him. I've known him and his family my whole life, and I can't think of any other people that my life is more entangled with than with the Pierce family. So it's really great to be here. The book of Job is one of the most enigmatic books of the Bible. The setting of Job is ambiguous. Little can be said with certainty about the time or place where the story occurs. It seems like Job and the other characters in the story are from the lands east of the Jordan, from Syria, Arabia, Mesopotamia, away from the main stage of Israelite history. And they're Gentiles, yet they know. 
The Jewish Talmud records that Job lived in a time before the Mosaic Law, a place which helps us make sense of the total absence of references to the Mosaic Law. And the Greek Septuagint links Job with a king of Edom that's mentioned in Genesis 36, a king named Jobab. But these are minor connections that don't really tell us much. The text itself, Job 1.1, says he was blameless and upright, a man who feared God and turned away from evil. And that's what we need to know. The majority of the book, chapters 3 through 37, consist of a series of dialogues between the righteous man Job and his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and later Elihu. No other book of the Bible, with the possible exception of the Gospel of John, is so conversational. The main topic of these dialogues is the justice of God. Job, you see, had suffered immensely. In the first two chapters of the book, he loses everything. His considerable wealth, his home, his ten children, his wife. And he's also stricken with a disease and cast out of the community, enduring both physical pain and the social stigma of the unclean. Even his family turns away from him. But most painful of all, it seems that God himself has forsaken Job. Despite Job's faithfulness and righteousness, God has allowed this suffering. Perhaps God is even the cause of this suffering. And so Job cries out to God for answers. God's power, God's sovereignty, Job never doubts. If you look at chapter 9, he says, God is mighty. In strength, it's verse 4. Verse 5, he's able to move mountains. Verse 6, he can shake the earth. Verses 8 and 9, he's the creator of all things. He says in verse 19, if it's a contest of strength, he is the strong one. If it's a matter of justice, who can make him answer for anything? He recognizes this point, that God is all-powerful. And that God can do what God wants to do. Job wants answers. But he doubts that God is paying attention. He says in chapter 9 verse 16, If I summon God and he answered me, I do not believe that he would listen to my voice. His friends, his companions, they have answers for Job rooted in a certain kind of wisdom tradition. They speak out of a wisdom tradition that was common across the ancient Near East. It can be found in the wisdom literature of Sumeria, of Babylon, of Egypt. And it's a tradition which is represented in the biblical Proverbs. For instance, Proverbs 10, 16 and 17. The way of the righteous leads to life the gain of the wicked sin. And you hear something similar in many of the Psalms. For instance, Psalm 37, 25. I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. The wisdom of these traditions is straightforward. The righteous are rewarded, and the wicked are punished. And, you know, we kind of make sense of this by thinking, well, eventually the righteous are rewarded and the wicked are punished. But the texts are clear. For instance, Proverbs 11.31, the righteous are repaid on earth. How much more the wicked and the sinner? They're not thinking about the afterlife. They're thinking in this life, the righteous are rewarded and the wicked are punished. Now, there's a tension between Job and his friends because his friends are saying, hey, look, you're being punished. You must be wicked. And Job is insisting on his innocence and his righteousness. And this tension between Job and his friends is actually mirrored in the biblical text itself. Because on the one hand, we have the Proverbs 
which present a predictable and stable moral universe in which good is rewarded and evil is punished. Proverbs 11.21, Be assured the wicked will not go unpunished, and those who are righteous will escape. On the other hand, we have the book of Ecclesiastes, which says the opposite. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to the skillful. But time and chance happen to them all. Ecclesiastes 9.11 Like Ecclesiastes, Job's story challenges this predictable moral universe of conventional wisdom. Job says in chapter 12, verse 6, The tents of the robbers are at peace. They should be punished, but they seem okay. Guided by this conventional wisdom, Job's friends keep insisting, You must have sinned, Job. You must have done something. Eliphaz, in chapter 4, verse 7, says, Think now, who that was innocent ever perished? Or when have the upright ever been cut off? Even though his friends are reflecting or are articulating a biblically informed wisdom, Eliphaz is just saying something like you might hear in Proverbs. The friends are rebuked by God at the end of Job. Chapter 42, verse 7, My wrath is kindled against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, but my servant Job has. When I'm teaching, I often present this apparent contradiction to my students. And I say, which is it? Do we live in an ordered moral universe where the righteous is rewarded in this life? Or do we live in a chaotic moral universe where the good sometimes suffer and the wicked sometimes enjoy rewards? Which one is it? And the answer, of course, is yes. <laughs> yeah. Both are true. Generally speaking, we recognize the wisdom of the Proverbs. Generally speaking, if you do right, you will enjoy rewards in this life. And if you do evil, you're going to suffer. That's generally true. And that's why the wisdom literature of the Sumerians and the Babylonians and the Egyptians, they knew that too, because you can just look and see this is a fact about the world. And yet all of us know there are exceptions. All of us know that sometimes the innocent do suffer through no fault of their own. And we have Job and Ecclesiastes to help us make sense of those exceptions. But if you read through Proverbs, there aren't any little footnotes that say, see Job for exceptions. Or read Ecclesiastes for another perspective. Instead, we have all of those books in our Bible because God expects us to read all together and to actually see these perspectives on the world. In other words, the wisdom of the Bible, like the wisdom in the book of Job, is presented as a kind of conversation. Job spars with Eliphaz or Bildad just as the book of Job grapples with the book of Proverbs. God gives us both sides of the conversation. And then he invites us into that conversation to bring our own experiences with suffering and pain. Because the search for wisdom requires dialogue, conversation. It's what we see in the Bible. Often, more than one perspective, just put in there side by side. And we have to use our wisdom to make sense of it. And the way that the Bible structured in this conversational style, it shouldn't surprise us or disturb us because it reflects who God is. Remember, God is a three-in-one being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's a sense in which... From eternity, God has existed in conversation with himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so his word to us reflects his own inner life. 
The book of Job is exceptional in its commitment to dialogue. And in the time that remains, I want to consider three other ways in which we see God in conversation. First with Job, then with all creation, and then with Satan. We've already seen in chapter 9 that Job doesn't really think God will answer his questions. I would speak to the Almighty, he says, in chapter 13, verse 3, and I desire to argue my case with God. He wants to talk to God. He just, again, isn't confident that God will answer. Indeed, part of the pathos of the book of Job is that it seems like God is absent. It seems like God has abandoned it. Like the psalmist in Psalm 22, like Jesus himself on the cross, Job cries out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Job just wants to know why. Chapter 10, verse 3, he addresses God, Does it seem good to you to oppress, to despise the work of your hands and favor the schemes of the wicked? If you've ever had a toothache, or an ingrown toenail, or some other malady. You know that physical pain and suffering has this tendency to isolate us, to turn us inward. If your tooth aches, your whole world shrinks down to the size of a molar. That's all you can think about. It consumes you. Suffering isolates us. It cuts us off from each other, even from our loved ones. It cuts us off from the world. You can't hear the birds singing when your foot's hurting. You miss out on the beauty. Our world can be reduced to that pain, to that sensation. It will consume us. And this is what's happening with Job. At one point in chapter 7, verse 16, he says, Just leave me alone to die. Yet the faithfulness of Job is that he resists this isolation. He does not allow himself to be cut off. He remains in dialogue with his friends. And I put friends in quotes here. Uh, at one point he says, my companions are treacherous. But he also remains in contact with God. Even though, again, he's not sure if God will answer him. He doesn't ever stop talking to God. He questions God. He accuses God. He comes really close to denouncing God. But he never stops talking to God. And eventually God does respond to Job. Chapters 38 to 41 record God's response. And it's one of the longest conversations in the whole Bible between a single individual and God. God appears to him in the whirlwind. He says, gird up your loins like a man. And what follows in those chapters is one of the most spectacular parts of Scripture. It's a tour de force of God's power and might and creativity. Yet, many modern commentators have observed that in that monologue, God seems to be ignoring Job's fundamental question. Which is why do the righteous suffer? God just seems to be showing off his mighty power. There's nothing about justice. There's no explanation for why the innocent suffer. And remember, Job actually never questioned God's power. He knew that God was the sovereign creator of the world. Only thing Job questioned was God's goodness. There's a danger if we just see these chapters as God affirming his power and saying, don't ask questions, Job, that this comes across as a conversation stopper. I'm in charge. I'm in control. You don't get to ask any questions, Job. Just deal with it. God is super powerful, and he can do what he wants. But if this were true, I think it would negate the very conversational structure of the book of Job in addition to raising a lot of really difficult questions about the nature of God. So what are we to make of this? 
Well, one of my teachers, um, the philosopher Eleanor Stump, she made some interesting observations about God's whirlwind speeches, which have given me a new perspective on these texts. In her book, Wandering in Darkness, which is all about suffering, she argues that Job 38 to 42, God is actually demonstrating his loving relationship to the non-human world. If you read these verses carefully, you'll see that God portrays himself as a parent and the elements of the created order as his children. For instance, the morning stars are called the sons of God, chapter 38, verse 7. And in the very next verse, God adopts maternal imagery, presents himself as a mother. He says, the sea bursts forth from his womb. God used the clouds to swaddle the sea like an infant, like a mother's, you know. The ice and the hoarfrost are produced from God's womb, chapter 38, 28, and 29. And then back to paternal imagery in 38, 28, where he is the father of the rain. He also has this relationship with the animals. In chapter 38, verse 41, the hungry ravens don't cry out to their mother. They cry out to God. Chapter 38, verse 40, he feeds the lions. Chapter 39, verse 9, the wild ox spends the night at God's crib. And none of these examples compares with the great delight that God takes in the monsters, Behemoth and Leviathan, the first of the great acts of God, the king over all that are proud. When God describes Behemoth and Leviathan, he sounds like a proud father bragging about his children. God plays with Leviathan chapter 41 verse 5 like a bird like a pet and to this absolutely terrifying creature chapter 41 verse 3 god speaks soft words god is not intimidated or threatened by this creature but he has a relationship with these monsters god is all powerful no question god rules creation but God is not a tyrant over creation. God is not saying in these texts, just shut up, I'm in charge. Just deal with your suffering, I'm the strong one here. It's quite the opposite. God's power is not the same kind of power as the tyrant. It's not the power of force and strength. God's power as presented in these chapters is the power of speech. The soft words that God speaks to Leviathan are like the words, the soft words, which God used to bring creation into existence in the beginning. Let there be light. You see in other creation stories from this time period, you know how the gods make the world. They are breaking things, uh, using the dead body of their enemies in the Babylonian story to create the world, forcing and forming the mud into certain shapes. Those are the other kinds of stories, but in our creation story, in Genesis, God doesn't ever force, but God calls, beckons, invites, and creation responds. And that's what we see in these chapters in Job too. There's a kind of conversation going on because what happens when God says, let there be light? Job 38, 7 says, The morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The response of creation is to sing. And you see the back and forth. God speaks, and then creation or sings, shouts for joy. There's this back and forth. In Job 38, 25, when God speaks to the lightnings, the lightnings say, Here we are back and forth, the dialogue. This is how Stump sums this up in her book. She says, God relates to everything he has made. He deals as a parent with his creatures, from the sea and rain 
to the raven and the donkey, to behemoth and leviathan. He brings them out of the womb, swaddles, feeds, and guides them, and he even plays with them. Most importantly, he talks to them. And somehow, in some sense or other, they talk to him in return. <coughs> if this is a fair reading of the text, then what God is stressing to Job in these final chapters is not his sheer power, but it's rather his personal, even parental relationship of care for all creation. Which is exactly what Job is concerned about. Does God care? Is God good? And if God shows care and concern for even the smallest creatures, will he not also care for Job? Before closing, we have to say something about the framing story in chapters 1 and 2. Not only be comprehensive, but also because these chapters potentially cut against this argument that God cares for Job. It would not be difficult to read the opening chapters of Job and see Job as a kind of pawn in a heavenly game, a kind of the object of a gentleman's wager between God and Satan. Job just gets caught up. So what's going on in those first couple of chapters? Well, once again, we have a conversation, but this time in the heavenly realm. The Bene Elohim, the sons of God, are presenting themselves to God. And among them is one called Hasatan, Satan, the accuser. This being is also a son of God. But he is an estranged son, one who is no longer at home in the Father's presence. This being, Satan, is opposed to God. And he's even been actively working to turn other people against God. When God mentions his faithful servant Job, Satan already knows about Job. And he already knows about this protective hedge about him. Presumably because he's already tried to attack Job, but unsuccessfully. Stump makes sense of this story through the analogy of an estranged child. I love this picture. An estranged child who shows up for a family dinner unexpectedly. And maybe some of you can relate to this story. The child isn't unwelcome at home because it's a child. But the relationship is strained. This is a child who's left. This is a child who's turned away, who's rejected the family in some way. The parents might ask the child, what have you been up to? What have you been doing? And, of course, what does God ask Satan? Where have you been? What have you been doing? I've been roaming the earth to and fro. Stump argues that God's questions to Satan, of course, he's not gaining information from Satan. He knows what Satan's been doing. But the questions that God asks to Satan are the same kinds of questions that a loving parent might ask to an erring child in order to bring them back. And what does God do? He offers up Job as an example of a good son. Hey, have you noticed Job? Perhaps so that Satan might reconsider his own rebellious stance and return to his father. Now it's not clear to me if Satan's capable of repenting. We do know that he and the other rebellious angels are destined for eternal fire. Jesus says so in Matthew 25, 41. But this portrait of a father who never gives up on a wayward son is consistent with, for instance, the parable of the prodigal son. And again, if God still cares even for the rebellious Satan, does he not also care for his servant Job? Now, you can still argue that God seems to be sacrificing Job to make a point to Satan. He's willing to make Job suffer, to take away everything. <coughs> Even if it was for the good of Satan, it would be hard to say God is good when he's 
makes this person suffer or allows this person to suffer. But if God had refused to allow Satan to test Job, if God had said, no, I have to keep protecting him, he would have demonstrated a lack of confidence in Job. I think this is a really interesting point. We all know that Job is faithful to God. I know that my Redeemer lives, though he slay me. <laughs> but what the prologue of Job shows is that God also believes in Job. Enough to allow him to endure this terrible suffering. Because God believes that Job will make it through. And the suffering does not ultimately diminish Job. Quite the opposite, in fact. The Lord's brother James says in James 5.11, You've heard of the endurance of Job. And you have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. For the Lord is compassionate and merciful. If Job had not demonstrated this endurance, this patience through such terror, we would not be having a lectureship about him today. We would not know his name. We would not know who he was. He would just be another righteous sheik that lived three or 4,000 years ago. And that would be that. But we are still talking about Job and thinking about Job and holding Job up as, a, as an example. Job came through this experience enlarged. And he not only gained this everlasting reputation for righteousness and patience, but the text itself shows that he was transformed personally by these experiences. After that conversation with God at the end of the book, he says in chapter 42, 5 and 6, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself in dust and repent in dust and ashes. When we first meet Job in chapter 1, he's kind of a helicopter parent, kind of an anxious parent. He's offering these sacrifices for his kids every day just in case they've, they've sinned. Maybe they've said something in their heart. So he's, he's anxious He's worried about his kids. But by the end of the book, after his fortunes have been restored and he's blessed with another set of children, he's depicted differently. Gone is that anxiety that we saw in chapter 1. Here is a man, according to 42.17, who lives life to its fullest. And we get the names of his children at the end of the book. His children at the beginning aren't named. But he's blessed with three daughters at the end. And they have names that are unique. They don't come up again anywhere in the Old Testament. They're called Jemima, Keziah, and Karen Hapuch. And these names can be translated something like dove, cinnamon spice, and glitter. As one Old Testament scholar says, it seems like Job has named his daughters with pizzazz. He's a different man at the end of this than he was at the beginning. My prayer for us in this gathering is that we can see God through these conversations, through these dialogues. I think we often experience God sort of speaking one way and it's just up to us to deal with it. But Job, Job who has this deep relationship with God, Job is able to speak, God speaks back and the conversation continues. It's a conversation that we have personally with God. It's a conversation that we enter to into scripture the Word of God, which is also potentially a kind of dialogue, just as we pray Scripture. And of course, that we can talk to each other. It actually seems really easy to talk to God and to understand the Bible when compared with just trying to get along with each other sometimes in the midst of our own disagreements. 
and especially in the face of those hard things, suffering and death, grief and anger, the nature of God, how to run the church, how to run the college, I don't know. And my prayer is that God would bless us in that dialogue and in those conversations, whether it be the lingering existential questions or the everyday things that we have to get through. And my prayer is that like Job, we would not be diminished by these conversations, but that we would be transformed. Transformed by our encounters with each other, transformed by our encounter this week with this enigmatic but brilliant book of Job, and by the loving Father who has inspired it and safeguarded it through the ages to us. We have about five minutes. Jeremy said you don't normally have questions, but uh, if anybody has anything they want to say, I'd love to hear a response or a question. I've just talked about conversation and dialogue for 30, 40 minutes. I should practice that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So he's in dialogue with creation. That's what you hear in chapters 38 to 40, and the other is the, the dialogue with Satan in chapters 1 and 2. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, I think it's always accurate to say he didn't know God fully, which I can say about myself, you know. So he does come to know God more deeply through these experiences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You've been very kind. Appreciate being here. I hope you enjoy the rest of the lectureship. Thank you. Thank you, Alden. Um, we'll take a break until about 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, we'll have our split classes. Uh, ladies, uh, you'll be over here to my left, to your right. Uh, guys, we'll be over here to my right, to your left. Uh, on the ladies' side, we will have with us Miss Karen Summit. Uh, Miss Karen uh, works with the women's ministry at the Seventh and Muller Church here in Perigold. Um, when you walk in, students, when you walk into the cafeteria and you see the, the paintings of the two individuals, the man and the woman hanging there, uh, that's Miss Karen's parents. Uh, they love this school. She loves this school. And I can assure you, uh, you will not be disappointed in what she has to present today. Uh, and then I will be more disappointed on this side because I'll be speaking uh, to the guys. Uh, but this year we're doing something a little bit different with the classes, with the men and women. We're giving the same topics to both. Uh, and so uh, the topic for the 10 o'clock hour is going to be loneliness and isolation. Uh, you're going to see that this is a growing pandemic uh, throughout generation, from generation to generation. The younger the generation, the more uh, we struggle with these uh, issues. Uh, so very relevant topics. And so students particularly, I think you're going to enjoy uh, those. Uh, in the time of the break, please fellowship with one another. Uh, if you are a guest and you're hungry, we have some muffins and danishes on the table. Uh, I need to be clear about this. I don't want to yell at any students. I got accused of yelling at students last year. I'm not, I'm not wanting to yell, but students, that's just, I'm sorry, that's not for you. If you get hungry at the cafeteria, uh, you know where it's at, or you can get something at Peach Treats. Along those lines, for our guest, um, if you like coffee, uh, at Peach Treats, you can buy a mug, and you can fill that mug with coffee all week long. And so uh, if you really like your coffee, uh, please invest in one of our CRC mugs um, and drink coffee. Am I forgetting anything? Okay. We'll take about a 10-minute recess or 15-minute recess, and then we'll uh, join back up for our classes.